the far east of Russia, in the Siberian region, right on the border of North Korea and China, is an area known as Primoria, a territory similar in size to Wisconsin. 80% of this mountainous terrain is covered in forest. Primoria is so far into the far east that if you were to measure from Primoria to Moscow, and then from Primoria to Australia, you'd see it's closer to Australia than it is to Moscow. The territory of Primoria, officially known as Primorsky Krai, has a mixed variety of wildlife, with large mammals like musk deer, wolves, black and brown bears, as well as the critically endangered Amur leopard. But a bigger cat is printed on the flag and coat of arms of Primorsky Krai, the critically endangered Amur tiger, also known as the Siberian tiger. The forest of Primorsky Krai in the East Siberian taiga may be remote, but there are some people living in the area, and of course, wherever there are tigers, there are poachers. While humans are certainly a bigger threat to tigers than they are to us, entering into their domain, especially while looking for one of them, can be very dangerous. According to some sources, about once a year, someone is killed by a Siberian tiger. Most seem to be trappers that got too close. Although, looking through accounts, it seems like Sometimes years can pass without anyone being killed. About once every four years, there is an unprovoked attack from a potential man-eater. And sometimes, on very rare occasions, it seems a tiger will kill someone for revenge. On December 5th, 1997, a man named Yuri Trush got an urgent message that he was needed in the taiga forest. Trush was the leader of an inspection tiger unit, a team of rangers that fight against forest crime, particularly poaching, and it's a dangerous job. There is a lot of money in tigers, and corruption was rampant in the mid-90s in almost all tiers of government. The people involved in the trade of tiger bones, whiskers, and skins be they poachers or corrupt officials, were pretty dangerous. Historically, the poachers have been winning the battle. The range of the Amur tiger has shrunk significantly, and their numbers have fallen off a cliff. According to facts and details, the Amur tiger would be extinct if not for the Second World War, drawing so many people away from the area and closing all the borders. A ban was put on tiger hunting in 1947, but as you can probably imagine, the ban didn't stop poaching outright, and Yuri Trush and Inspection Tiger had to work pretty hard to fight against poaching. But this time, Trush wasn't called to arrest someone for breaking the laws of the remote land, but to investigate a tiger attack. Traveling around in the remote forests of Primorsky Krai could be treacherous, and not only from tigers. Entering into this far east region was like taking a trip into the wild west, and they had to go in prepared. Trush brought two of his squad mates with him, Alexander Gorbarukov and Sasha Lazarenko. They traveled in an old army truck, and were all armed with knives, pistols, and rifles. In the Tiger by John Valiant, he describes them as some kind of wilderness SWAT team. They are certainly serious grounded men. Some might call people like Yuri a ranger's ranger. While Trush was a soldier in Kazakhstan, he was an accomplished athlete, winning a dozen regional kayaking championships, and he also won many local weightlifting tournaments. He was skilled at hand-to-hand -hand combat, particularly karate and aikido. He was so skilled, in fact, he taught hand-to-hand -hand combat to the military police. With a description like that, it's no wonder John Valiant described him as the alpha male wilderness cop, ready to throw down at a moment's notice. However, even a tougher than nails person like him would be shaken from what he was about to find waiting for him in the forest. And Yuri had already received many death threats before. In the book The Tiger, the area is described as similar to that of Sherwood from The Legends of Robin Hood, with some poachers simply trying to get food to survive. But some stories remind me more of Mad Max. There are many illegal firearms in the taiga, and Yuri has been shot at multiple times. And in one story, he even had to intercept a tank going through the forest. Now, the tank did have its gun removed, 
but it was still a tank nonetheless. Inside were rich executives going on a fun little poaching trip, and they were not happy about being stopped by Yuri, and even less happy that he was filming them, and when that tape ended up being broadcast on Russian national television, they were outraged. Of course, they threatened Yuri Trush. They said he might get lost in the forest, but he didn't waver. In The Tiger, it describes Yuri's philosophy that if someone powerful wanted him dead in Russia, there was nothing he could do about it. There is even, apparently, a similar philosophy regarding the tiger. Once a tiger wants you dead, you're as good as. The old military truck plunged deeper into the forest, taking dirt roads alongside the Bikin River. It was below freezing, and snow covered the landscape. They made one stop along the way to pick up a sheriff named Bush. It was policy to have a police officer there if a body was involved. It took many hours before they reached their destination, a cabin, where Vladimir Markov had his final moments. The cabin was in a clearing, the edges of which were surrounded by a thick forest. The sky and surrounding trees were darkened by crows, indicating a tiger had recently made a kill that they could scavenge on. Apparently this is quite a common occurrence, as Su Yong Park noted in his book, Great Soul of Siberia, when carnivores have hunted prey, crows somehow find out and spread the news far and wide. The wilderness SWAT team weren't the only people there. Another truck was parked outside the cabin, and three other men were waiting for the arrival of the rangers. The three men were Danila Zaitsev, Sasha Dvornik, and Andrei Onofrechuk, all friends of Markov, the man who had been killed. Markov's friends had been at the cabin since the night before, and tried to prevent the tiger from dragging Markov's body into the woods. They made loud noises, banged pots, and didn't go anywhere alone. It was dark. But the tiger was there, skirting the edge of the torchlight. It came within 15 meters of some of the men. Trush took out a video camera and started to film the carnage around the cabin. Markov didn't actually own the cabin. It belonged to Ivan Dunkai, a friend and mentor. He was an older hunter who had let Markov use the cabin when he was hunting. Yuri and the team surveyed the area and found the few remains of Markov scattered around. One pile of clothes and broken bones. A large prince, or spore, of a large tiger circled the cabin. The gun, which Markov very likely had, was nowhere to be found. Markov and his surviving friends had been busted by Yuri Trush in the past for possessing illegal firearms. Chances are they hid the gun before Yuri arrived. But in the moment, Yuri didn't care about that. He was focused on trying to figure out what happened. Not only were there large tiger spore circling the cabin, but patches in the snow where the tiger had rested for a time. The carnage wasn't just limited to the outside. The cabin, which was more of a trailer with a shed attached to it, was trashed inside. The tiger had gotten in and ripped apart practically everything. Tiger attacks happen, but something was off about this attack. Something strange had happened. Trush had his dog, Laika, with him. Dogs and tigers generally don't mix well in the taiga, or maybe anywhere, but at the same time, a dog with its superior sense of smell and hearing can be an early warning for a nearby tiger. Yuri could tell by Laika's behavior if a tiger was nearby, and when, on that day, Laika began barking and the hackles on her back and neck were standing up, he knew the tiger was coming back. As stated, Yuri Trush had met Vladimir Markov before, over a year before the tiger attack. While Yuri Trush was on a routine patrol, he found a dead badger in a pot by a stream close to the cabin. He went to the cabin and found Markov there. Markov tried to tell him that the badger had been chased into the pot by dogs and then it had died in the pot, but Yuri cut open the badger with a knife and found a shotgun pellet. Now Yuri could have gotten Markov into a lot of trouble for having a gun and a hunting knife, which wasn't allowed at the time, at least not without a license. But as long as Markov gave up the gun, which he did, Yuri would let it slide. Trush was sympathetic to the local population, and even though he went after wealthy, important people, and sometimes even local police, with those who were struggling to survive, he would often let minor offenses slide a bit. Life's tough in the taiga, 
and in the village of Sobolinya, where Markov was from. Sobolinya is a small logging community in the forest, far from Markov's original home of Kaliningrad. He was sent there while serving as a paratrooper, as part of a troop buildup due to escalating tensions between Russia and China on the border. Kaliningrad is even further from Sobolinya than Moscow, and unfortunately, Markov would never get to visit his family again, and they too in turn would never make the journey out to see him. But he started a new family in the newly created Sobolinya. The small town was basically created by a logging company to harvest the local oak and pine, with a population of just 450 people at its peak. It was a rather small town, surrounded by the taiga forest, the village got their electricity from a diesel generator in town. It might not sound like an ideal place to live, but at first, it actually did seem like a good settlement. The surrounding forest provided game, as well as fruit, nuts, and herbs. The logging company provided employment, but they also built a school, a library, a clinic, stores, and all the other things a small village would need. As described by Mr. Valiant, it was a place of optimism and fresh starts, and from their vantage, communism worked. Here, man, nature, and industry could coexist for the common good. And Markov was a pillar of the community by all accounts. He and his wife had a son in 1982, and he was known not just for being kind to his own child, but to all the children in the village, using what little resources he had to help any child that fell ill. He helped out with odd jobs around the village, including shifts to look after the power generator. He had the nickname Marquise, meaning something equivalent to Duke, and he was also known for being a bit of a chef, able to improve any meal with different herbs that he had gathered from the surrounding taiga. But the most notable thing about Marquise was his sense of humor and charisma. He had a natural ability to lighten up any boring moment with a well-timed joke. His magnetism and people skills, as well as his driving skills, ended up getting him the job of personal driver of Boris Ivanovich, the head of the logging company. And so, Marquise would drive his boss through the Siberian forest in a limo. You might be thinking Sobolinya sounds like a nice place to live, and for a time, perhaps it was, but all good things must come to an end. After the fall of the Soviet Union, many government-owned companies collapsed, and the logging company was one of them. And remember, they were the reason the village even existed. When buildings burned down, including houses, no one came to repair them. People who used to have steady jobs now had to live off the land, as best as they could. But without the investment, the village began to crumble. As a local woman once said, Who needs Sobolinya now? Nobody does. When I search Sobolinya in Google now, the main results, apart from the tiger attacks, are abandoned Russia and Russia's decaying villages. At times like this, some people might try to leave, but Marquis did not. The village needed his skills and his humor more than ever. He still did what he could for the village, sometimes staying in the small generator building all night, making sure the little diesel engine was providing power to the town. I know this is a tangent, but I think it's kind of important to give a bit of context. Often, this story is just a footnote. A poacher messed around with a tiger and was killed. Poacher isn't a word that invokes positive feelings, but Markov was more than just a poacher. He was a father, he was a husband. He was Marquise, a flame of light in the frigid depths of this eastern Russian village. But what really happened? What went down between him and the tiger? Back at the cabin, there was tension in the air. Laika was barking, and the tiger's presence could be felt. The tiger couldn't be seen, and no earth-shattering roar was bellowing through the air. But at one point, there was an exhale a low sound from some animal in the surrounding forest. Whatever it was, it didn't reveal itself to the men, but Yuri believed it was the tiger. Now, it was time to solve the mystery. Why was this tiger so hell-bent on killing Marquise? So much so that it circled the cabin multiple times, seemingly spending hours waiting in the snow. What rage drove it to destroy anything in the cabin that had a hint of Markov's scent? It was time to investigate. Trush began interviewing the people of Sobolinya, those who had seen Markov before the attack, and a picture of his final moments was starting to form. 
However, some stories were different from others. Those who had seen him spoke of how he was gripped by fear, paranoid, and not at all himself. He kept saying, asserting, that the tiger was hunting him. It was coming for him. The fun-loving Marquise was gone and replaced with the shell of a terrified man. Some said the tiger had already gotten his soul. But why was this tiger coming for him? It was a difficult story to lock down. Some said it was a tigress who was after him because Marquise had shot her cubs and the mother tigress was out for revenge. The bond between a mother tiger and her cubs is strong. While there are some rare instances of males looking after cubs, such as the case in India in 2021 after the mother died, it's usually the mother that takes care and protects for the young. According to the Smithsonian, the cubs will stay with the mother for two to three years. The story made sense in some ways, and at the time, Yuri accepted it. The thought of Marquis killing tiger cubs does sound cruel and brutal, and despite the poaching, it is taboo amongst the locals to kill tigers. At the same time, the full body of a tiger could be worth thousands of dollars, some estimates going up to twenty to thirty thousand dollars. I think that's a pretty life-changing amount for anyone living in the Russian Far East, or anywhere else for that matter. However, there is a problem with this theory, and that problem was written in the snow, the footprints. Now, the first thing the tiger spore told the men was that the tiger had an injury to one of its front paws, where it had probably been shot. Nothing too severe, but it was limping a little. But secondly, the footprints were too big to be a female. As stated by Su Young Park in The Great Soul of Siberia, tigers' size, age, and sex can be determined by their pug marks and the length of their strides, and these were the footprints of a big male. There are some pretty large size claims of Siberian tigers from the past. Some I'm a little hesitant on, and there is a theory now that the extra big Amur tigers were all hunted, robbing the gene pool of those big tiger genes. But there were still big tigers in the taiga, and this big male may not have been a record breaker, but Sasha Lazarenko, one of the men on Yuri's team, said it was the biggest footprints he'd ever seen. There were other stories from interviews. Perhaps he wronged the tiger in another way. There seems to be a delicate balance between the locals and the tigers, a sort of unwritten law of the land about how they have to respect each other. Many seem to feel if you leave the tiger alone, they'll leave you alone. Don't wrong them and they won't wrong you. It's almost like a tiger is seen similar to a human, or at least they're on equal footing. The indigenous people of the region referred to the tiger as Amba. According to Peter Matheson in his book, Tigers in the Snow, Amba meant God to the indigenous people, but the word was given the meaning devil when Russians from the West arrived. It seems the word goes back and forth, and to some, it is seen as the grandfather of the forest. In fact, the tiger was referred to not as a man-eating tiger, but a cannibal tiger. Eating a human was seen as eating one of its own. Tiger attacks are rare, though there have been a few other accounts throughout recent history. In fact, one of the reasons this video took so long was that I've also made a second video about other different attacks in Eastern Russia for my patrons. I know I don't update that page very often, but I do really appreciate the support. And now there is another bonus video for my Megalodon patrons that goes through some of the other attacks from the 1950s up until today. But jumping back to Markov in 1997, did he disrespect the tiger? Well, how does one disrespect a tiger? Shooting it is obviously pretty disrespectful. Approaching too close or startling a tiger can also lead to an attack. But there's also the question of food. All living things need energy, of course, and you need a lot of energy to survive the climate of the taiga forest. The people of Sobolinya struggle to survive off the land, as do the tigers. Generally speaking, Predators are only successful at catching prey about 50% of the time. But for tigers, the number may be somewhat lower, although it kind of depends on which research you read. When we look at some older reports from the 1960s, from someone like George Schaller, the success rate was fairly low, about 1 in 12. Mr. Schaller is a biologist and conservationist who has been incredibly influential in his years as a conservationist, winning multiple awards for his efforts. 
He is best known, along with Diane Fossey, for helping protect the mountain gorillas of the Virungas. His book, The Deer and the Tiger, was one of the first to attempt this kind of research. But this was done on tigers in the Kanha Tiger Reserve in India, and many researchers at the time thought any estimate about success rate was mostly guesswork. If we jump ahead to 2013 and take a look at Tigers of the World, The Science, Politics, and Conservation of Panthera Tigris, second edition, by Tilson and Nias, we get a higher number. Quote, Estimates from the Russian Far East are likely to be more accurate because hunting attempts were reconstructed from tracks in the snow. Researchers there reported 54 and 38% success rates of Amur tigers hunting wild boar and red deer, respectively. End quote. It also seems like those higher numbers come from the winter months, when, somewhat surprisingly, the success rate could be a little higher, possibly due to a tiger having an advantage in the snow versus the ungulates like the deer and the boar that it preys on. That said, it all depends. Fewer ungulates survive in the deep snow, and their numbers are also plummeting anyway due to hunting and poaching. All of this is to say, when a tiger does manage to catch a boar in the winter, it does not want to part with its kill. By the natural laws of the forest, the meal belongs to the tiger, but it seems that a person broke these laws. Marquis, wandering the snowy landscape, at one point came across a freshly killed boar. A dead boar could not only feed him and his family, but he could give the extra meat to people in the area. He could even sell it. And there it was, right there in front of him. And Marquis made the fatal error of taking the tiger's meal. On an article written on facts and details, it states, Scientists who have tracked tigers for years believe that the animal will always return to a kill no matter how many days have passed. At some point, the tiger would have returned to see its kill had been stolen, and it wouldn't be hard to track down Marquis at the cabin. And when he saw the large, angry male tiger circling the tiny structure, he fired off a shot from inside, hitting the tiger in a front paw and scaring it away temporarily. Then, Markov himself fled the scene and went to the nearest people he could find. Or, another version of the story is that he encountered the tiger at the same time he stumbled upon the kill. The huge male most likely would have let out a thunderous roar, letting the intruder know the boar was tiger property, and Markov may have responded in the worst way possible. Now you might think, understandably so, that if you're going to be wandering through tiger territory, you'd want to be armed and have hunting dogs with you for protection. But John Valiant thinks this might be what caused the downfall of Markov. Imagine if he hadn't been armed when he came across the tiger and there weren't any dogs that were at risk. What would he have done when the tiger roared? Well, I imagine initially he would have frozen from the shock and fear of the moment, but then the experienced outdoorsman may have slowly backed away from the tiger until out of sight. And while there is no guarantee, there is a reasonable chance the tiger would let him be. After all, if it had a meal to consume and the human was going away, why waste the energy? But in the heat of the moment, with a tiger roaring and his dogs barking and fearing for his safety as well as his dog's safety and feeling a rifle in his hands, he may have taken the shot. And after the tiger retreated, he may have taken the meat. I don't think it's possible for us to ever know exactly what happened. And there are more versions of this story. But we do know that at some point, he took the tiger's kill. And at some point, he shot the tiger. Two things a tiger is unlikely to forgive. After that, Markov left the cabin and went to his friend and mentor, Ivan Dunkai the actual owner of the cabin, and he was acting weird. He told Dunkai there was a tiger out there hiding, and then suggested they go out and go hunting together. At this point, it was already dark, and Dunkai, puzzled by the proposal, suggested he stay with him and have some soup, but Markov refused and left out into the darkness. He went to a small logging camp. The men at the camp were interviewed about Markov. They said he was not at all himself, anxious, scared, constantly talking about a tiger that was hunting him and dogs that he had lost. They suggested he stay with them, but again, Markov refused 
and again he went out alone into the cold, dark night and walked back to the cabin. It's somewhat curious that he was so struck with fear and yet still went back all alone in the dark. The other thing that is curious is that the tiger was waiting. It had traveled the 11 kilometers or 6.8 miles to the cabin but then waited there. In a History Channel documentary on the subject, it said the tiger waited for 48 hours, and Mr. Valiant also gives the number of about 12 to 48 hours. The tiger just waited, as if knowing it didn't need to pursue Markov, that Markov would come back to him, and he did. So what was to be done about the large male tiger that had devoured a man? Well, in a sense, nothing. The thing is, for an animal to be declared a man-eater, it usually has to display a pattern of behavior that it has transitioned to hunting humans. In the documentary Conflict Tiger by Sasha Snow and in John Valiant's book, they mention that in India, a tiger has to kill four people before it is labeled a man-eater. I don't know how hard a rule that is, and I suspect it goes more on a case-by-case -case basis. But as for the tiger in the Russian Far East, it did seem like a distinctive case in some ways, considering how the tiger had not only almost completely consumed Markov, but also destroyed anything it could find with his scent. It seemed very particular. According to the zoologist Corbin Maxey, you can't look at the story of Vladimir Markov and not think this is a story of vengeance. And as ridiculous as this may sound to some people, on the bonus Patreon video, I do go through some cases where a tiger attacked once and then seemingly just disappeared back into the forest and never seemed to attack anyone again. Tigers do move around a lot. The range of a single tiger can be up to 100 kilometers squared or 39 square miles. And in the book, Mammals of the Soviet Union, it states that in 1945, it was conclusively established coming from the Amu Darya to the Sir Darya following wild boar traveled about a thousand kilometers, about two to three months. That is to say that the hope was that the tiger would move on, leave the area, go back to hunting deer or boar. However, that's not what happened. In the days following the death of Vladimir Markov, the town of Sobolinyo was plunged into despair and fear. People were afraid to leave their home, especially after dark, and people were wary of entering the taiga forest, or at least some were. There was a young man living with his parents in Sobolinyo of the name of Andrei Pochepnya, and according to the book, the tiger, Andre didn't have a great time at home, so he tried to spend as much time as possible with his friends hunting and trapping, especially his friend Dennis. The boys were both ex-soldiers and knew the tiger well, but after a few journeys into the forest, after Markov's death, the boys were forbidden to re-enter by their parents. Dennis obeyed, but Andre did not. As I said, he didn't have a great relationship with his family, and one morning, after a possible fight with his parents, he left home and went into the taiga to check some of the traps he had set up previously. And again, there was this idea that the tiger wouldn't attack anyone who hadn't wronged him, this law of the forest. And since Andre hadn't done anything to this tiger, perhaps he thought the tiger had no interest in attacking him. There was a cabin in the forest where Andre could spend the night. However, he only planned to go for one day. And after three days passed, concerns were growing. Dennis and his father went to the Pochepnia family home. Andre's mother was worried, but Andre's father was a night watchman, so they had to wait until the next morning for him to return home. And then, after four days, they gathered up a few more men and went into the forest to search for Andre. They found what was left of him. The gun Andre brought with him was loaded, but on inspection, they realized it had misfired. There was a mattress in the snow that the tiger had dragged out of a small makeshift structure, and then it seemed the tiger lay on the mattress and waited for Andre. Somehow, the tiger had sensed his approach, either by smell or sound, and waited to ambush him. When the news hit Trush on December the 15th, it hit him hard. 
and almost everyone held him personally responsible, saying he should have hunted down the tiger right away, that it was his fault an innocent young man had died. Markov's wife even yelled and shouted at him that it was all his fault, and the papers said the same. Many may have even wished the tiger had gotten Yuri Trush instead, and perhaps they would get their wish. It is important to remember, though, that Yuri Trush still thought it was a mother tigress that had attacked Markov to protect her cubs, and his main job was protecting tigers. But regardless, the tiger had to go. At this point, we should probably mention the boss of Inspection Tiger, Vladimir Shutinin, aka the General, on account of the fact he liked to dress in military attire including large officer hats. And he didn't filter his thoughts when it came to protecting the tigers of the Amur region. There is even an interview where British journalists asked him how tigers could be saved, and he simply said, AIDS. When they responded with, but don't you care about people, he replied, not really. He was a pragmatic man. As soon as he heard of the first tiger attack, he sent a fax to Moscow for a permit to shoot the tiger. But why immediately request permission to kill the tiger if the details weren't known? Well, he didn't really plan on killing the tiger, but he knew how the system worked and the slow, bureaucratic processes to get permission. So he asked for it preemptively, just in case. And when the tiger did attack again, he already had the authority to kill it. The hunt was on. Two trucks full of armed men pulled into Sobolinya. Yuri Trush and six others went to the attack site to try and confirm for certain it was the same tiger. And after examining the tracks and noting the limp in the tiger's step, they confirmed what they had already thought. It was the same tiger. And before the tiger added a third person to its list of kills, they had to hunt it down. They had their guns and a Kung military truck. And sitting in the back of the truck, the general allowed everyone a chance to speak about the best way of getting the tiger. The idea of hunting it by air in a helicopter was thrown out fast, as it was expensive and not particularly effective considering the thick tree cover around the Bikin River and Taiga Forest. Steel cage traps was also something discussed, but since there was a chance of catching the wrong tiger that could be injured in the process, and that it would also take days to get the traps delivered and set up, they decided it wasn't worth it. In the end, they decided they would split into two teams. One team would track the tiger on foot, and the other would go into the Kung and look for any signs of the tiger by the road. At night, they all slept in the Kung. Trying to track down a tiger in the dark was just too dangerous. On the first morning of the hunt, Dennis, the friend of the recently killed Andre, showed up on horseback, armed with a shotgun. He was going to join. It was a slow pace tracking the animal through the forest, and they could only go so fast. Yuri found tracks showing how the big male had attempted to catch a deer and failed. The injury may have only slowed the tiger down slightly, but slightly was all it took for a tiger to lose any edge it had on its prey. The tiger was hungry and getting hungrier. Moving through the forest, Trush and the general bumped into people hunting and foraging, and they ordered the people to leave, go home, and stay there until the tiger was dealt with. But often the people would refuse, adding more stress to the situation. They continued to track the animal and covered an area of almost a hundred square miles. They had even found tracks of a few other tigers in the area, but from the spore they could tell none were as big as the male. As they continued to track the tiger, something happened that Yuri Trush was afraid of. The tiger changed direction and had come right up to the outskirts of the village. Trush said they could see Sobolinya and were only two or three hundred yards away. The tracks went west into the forest, around the village, and now it was getting dark and they could no longer track the tiger. As soon as night fell, someone from the team got everyone inside. At midnight, the generator was shut down, and Sobolinya went dark. The only sound was the barking of dogs, and Trush thought maybe the tiger would take a dog in the night, but he was wrong. The next morning, 
They drove the Kong right into the small village, and Trush investigated if anything had happened the night before. And surprisingly, nothing had. No livestock, dog, or, most importantly, human, had been harmed. And when the tiger tracks were located again, it was clear the tiger, for whatever reason, hadn't gone near the village, despite all the easily available food. They did find that the tiger had forced its way into another cabin in the forest, but luckily, the owner hadn't been home when the tiger arrived. More days passed as they tried to track down the tiger, occasionally finding tracks on the roadside, only to get out and realize they were the tracks of a different tiger. They had been searching for the cannibal tiger for over a week now, but finally they had found more tracks and dismounted the Kung and followed the tracks into a clearing. There was Trush and two of his men. One of them, Pionka, put his hand down to test one of the tiger tracks. He swore and yelled, It's hot. The tiger was close. They walked through the clearing towards the forest, looking for any sign of the tiger. But before they hit the tree line, a roar like thunder exploded all around them. The roar of a tiger can be so loud, no one can even judge which direction the sound is coming from. Yet somehow, the tiger was there, in the clearing right by the men. It bounded through the snow, and with its jaws wide open and claws readied, it leapt through the air and slammed into Trush, in the same way it had probably attacked Markov and Andre. Mercifully for Yuri Trush, though, he was not alone, and in the few moments the tiger had pounced at him, the two other men had fired off eleven shots at the tiger, and Yuri himself managed to fire twice. The tiger still went into Trush, from the momentum he was scratched up, but his walkie-talkie had blocked a possible lethal blow from the tiger, and it hadn't been able to make a final neck grab, as his rifle had gone down the tiger's throat. Yuri got up, while one of the other men fired one more shot to make sure the tiger was dead. And it was the cannibal tiger who was dead. Trush did have some wounds, cuts on his arm, back, and thigh, and they were deep. They used pieces of metal cut from a can to staple him back together and sterilize the wound with some vodka. He never went to the hospital. Trush radioed the general, and the general told him, bring the tiger back to the village so that the people could see it was truly dead. After all, not everyone had much trust or faith in Inspection Tiger. They brought the tiger back to the village, and then they opened the back door of the Kung so people could see the tiger themselves. Some kicked and spat on the carcass, others asked what would become of the body, and many villagers had their chance to see the tiger, including Andre's sister and mother. After a while, the general took Yuri aside and told him, it's time to take the tiger away. They drove out into the forest and started skinning the big cat. They built a fire too. The general had burnt many a tiger pelt to prevent it from ending up in the wrong hands and the black market, but decided not to burn this one. When the men started cutting open the tiger, they realized it had many more wounds than initially thought. He had the wound in his left forepaw, but he had also been shot twice in the right rear leg with buckshot. Now, almost all of the bullets fired at the tiger by Trush's men and Trush himself had gone through. One of Yuri's bullets was still lodged in the animal, but they found multiple other bullets in the tiger. The end of its tail was also missing and had possibly been shot off. Valiant writes, Markov may not have been the beginning but rather the last straw. And Trush even said it was men who were responsible for the aggression of this animal. Sometimes people comment that any tiger will try to attack any person it sees, but this just isn't accurate. Clearly, a large predator like a tiger can be very dangerous, but there are also many other accounts where the tiger simply has no interest in attacking a person. The naturalist and author wrote about an incident in his book, Tigers in the Snow, where conservationists attempted to catch a big male in a snare to be tranquilized and then collared, but as the biologist approached, he broke free and bounded away. And I've read many other similar accounts. 
At the end of the day, the tiger definitely is a dangerous animal, but it generally doesn't have any interest in human affairs, and in many places, including the taiga, the tiger is under threat from humans. Habitat loss, as well as poaching, means the Amur tiger's numbers are low, but hopefully, through conservation efforts, the Amba will be able to hold on for many more years to come. If you enjoyed this story, I highly recommend you check out the documentary Conflict Tiger by Sasha Snow. It's available to rent or buy on Vimeo, and you might be able to get it on DVD. It has interviews with Yuri Trush, as well as other people in Sobolinya, and it even has some of the original footage filmed by Yuri Trush himself. The Tiger, a story of vengeance and survival by John Valiant, is probably the most comprehensive account of the attacks. But not only that, it also goes deep into the history of the region, the people involved, their backstories, as well as many other tiger attacks that happened in the area, ones that Yuri had to deal with. I highly recommend picking up that book if you want to learn more. The books Tiger in the Snow and The Great Soul of Siberia are great general books about the Amur tiger and tiger conservation. Those books and links to all the other sources I used will be below. I also now have a Twitter or an X if you want to follow me there for updates about upcoming videos and just general things. Again, thank you to my patrons, I hope you enjoy the bonus video, and thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day.